This is the house of God. And let me begin with the name of God in its Islamic form. We always say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in the name of God, the all-merciful, the infinitely compassionate. I'm very pleased to be able to participate in this very important conference dealing with an issue that is literally a matter of life and death for us today, that is the question of evil. The title of the conference itself is philosophically very significant, Naming Evil. Because according to all traditional philosophies, to name something meant also to know it and to be able to dominate over it. In the second chapter of the sacred scripture of Islam, the Quran, it is said that after God created Adam, he taught him the name of all things. So in a sense, to be able to understand evil, to name it, is also to be able to combat it, to confront it, and to overcome it. And to deny that there is such a thing as evil is to be dominated by evil. So let me start, first of all, with a general discourse, which is not specifically Islamic, but I think pertains to all theologies and metaphysics, much of which we have forgotten in our day and age, and that is, what is evil? Libraries have been written about what is evil, and of course the debate still continues. But all traditional societies have found a very satisfying answer for this question. And that is why when, let's say, Christianity was dominant in the West, or in the Jewish tradition, or in the Islamic tradition, and Hinduism, there was not a continuous quest for trying to understand what evil was. People knew what evil was. The quest was to overcome evil. But now the problem has come as, as to what is evil itself. And so let me return to basic principles. Being a philosopher, let me just say a few words from a philosophical point of view. From the point of metaphysics, there is the ultimate absolute reality, and that is God. What we call in the Abrahamic world, God. Other names have been given to that reality, or sometimes no name at all. That is possible to have also a non-theistic representation metaphysically of the ultimate principle. Now, the ultimate principle alone is good. Its character is goodness. In Islam, this is referred to as the name Ar-Rahma, Ar-Rahman, the name of mercy, of goodness, that is in the essence of God itself. And of course, in the Western tradition, everybody knows the Platonic dictum of the Tu'agathon, that is the supreme good, which Plato calls the divine principle of all things. Now, the supreme good, or God, is the only reality that is absolutely good. That is, there cannot be anything other than God which is pure goodness. Creation already implies a separation from the Creator, otherwise there would be no creation. And to talk of creation is to talk of separation. And is to talk of separation is to talk of what appears on the human plane as evil. So to be in creation is to have to confront the separation from the supreme good, the separation which is evil in our lives. This is really the metaphysical foundation for the presence of evil. To expect creation to have the same ontological status as the creator and to say, well, here is God, here is the world, why is God good, why is there evil in the world? In fact, it's to misunderstand that only God is and we are only relatively in the world of existence. He is the absolute being, and since we are not God, the world is not God, there has to be evil, there has to be this separation. In fact, one could go so far as to say that metaphysically speaking, God cannot create a world without privation or evil and remain God. Which this is to reverse completely the arguments which have been given by a large number of modern Western philosophers, against the existence of a good God by the fact that there is evil in the world. It's very paradoxically quite interesting that this uh, awareness of the existence of evil in the world, the so-called question of theodicy, created by a good God, has turned a large number of people, intelligent people, away from religion in the West. And has never done that in other parts of the world. People in India have seen evil. 
the Buddha looked at suffering, dukkha, which is one of the principles of Buddhism. And in Islam, it's said in the Quran over and over again that evil is enmeshed with human existence in this world. But this did not lead people to leave religion. And the main reason is that this simple metaphysical principle, which I stated, had been to a large extent forgotten. So to speak in a non-Abrahamic language, since these terms have become so common now in modern American culture, the world as Maya is by nature Maya, or in a Buddhist term, you cannot be in the samsara without the existence of the nature of samsara. To live in separation from God is impossible without suffering the consequences of that separation, which is separation from the supreme good. To live in the world of relativity is to be separated from the absolute principle, from the divine principle. And hence, to be faced with that privation, that separation, which on the human plane appears as evil. Now, from the point of view of the divine principle, there is no evil. In the sun, there are no shadows. And that is why certain sages, certain great mystics in Islam, especially in Islam, like the famous figure now so well known in American culture, Jalal al-Din Rumi, and also a number of Christian mystics, have denied the reality of evil. And that is a very dangerous thing if it's not closely understood. Those who have denied evil, and some have argued that Christ, by pointing to the white tooth of the dead dog, was referring to the same thing, tried to point out to the goodness, even in what appears to us to be evil. Uh, these were human beings were really speaking from the point of view of the divine. Yes, it is possible to reach a stage of realization in which one does not see evil because one has transcended the world of evil, this world of separation from God. And there is an art that in Islamic uh, spiritual disciplines has been emphasized a great deal, and that is the positive art of being always able to see the good aspect of things, not to see the privation, not to see the evil, but to see everything in its metaphysical transparency, to see the fact that by the existence of things comes from the existence of God, because, of course, God as goodness and evil as privation are not existentially equal, no more than is light and are light and shadow. The shadow has certain qualities. We go in the shade when it's hot, but from a point of existence, the shadow is simply the absence of light and therefore there is no equality between the two. Now, there is a great danger in our world today. Two dangers, in fact, which are opposite to each other, but let me begin with the first. The first is to deny evil. Deny that there's such a thing as evil in the theological sense, in the, in the relative order. And therefore, the false idea of being able to turn the world into the completely good, as if the world could become God. A kind of false generosity, which ultimately comes out something like communism, in which you deny the good with a capital G, but try to do good on the level of humanity, even if you were to do it in the right way. In a sense, Marxism is a distortion and deviation of Christian charity in a certain sense. And other philosophies such as this, which are very prevalent, in which one throws oneself at the world, thinking that one can make the world completely good and not aware of the reality of evil, how deep it is in the very texture of human existence. So this is one very great danger in the world in which we live, and that is to deny evil on the relative plane. And to do so means to be a, unable to be prevented from ever transcending evil. To deny evil on the level of the relative plane, on the level of which, in which we ordinary human beings live, is the best way of preventing us from ever transcending evil. Because to transcend evil is ultimately to transcend the relativity of the human order, evil, evil in its total sense. The other great danger 
which is now lurking on the horizon evermore is to bring back the notion of evil in a politicized way and to um, use it and misuse it, in fact, by demonizing the enemy and by absolutizing our own goodness. There's a danger which has come into the world only in the last few years, into the Western world, and it's extremely dangerous because of the tremendous power which that world has. If this position had been taken by Argentina or Burma, it would have been of little consequence to the world. But being taken, especially in the United States, by certain people, it is something of the greatest danger, namely to define evil simply from the narrow point of view of our own interests and to demonize all that which is against it, to refuse to understand the perspective of others and to simply call others evil by the fact that we don't like them. Now, mind you, this is not new in human history. It had been done before, but it never before meant what we have in our hands today in ways of power. That is, let's say if the Roman Empire demonized the Persian Empire, or the Persian Empire opposed the Roman Empire, or the Chinese opposed the Mongolians, and so forth and so on down the line. It wasn't that there was the power of total destruction, of disruption, of bombs which are the size of the stage on which I'm standing, which are not called mass destruction, other things are called weapons of mass destruction, and all that goes on, and all the playing with tremendously powerful forces which are unprecedented in human history. And this is one of the great paradoxes of our situation. Namely, certain forms of evil have become accentuated because of the application of a science of nature which denies the category of good and evil, which is supposed to be neutral vis-a-vis -vis good and evil. You think about what I have said a moment, you'll see how important this point is that we very, very rarely talk about. That is the evil that results from the application of a science of nature which has denied the reality of the categories of good and evil in cosmic life, in cosmic existence, which considers these categories to be simply human and subjective with no correspondence in the world out there. And this is one of the great paradoxes of our times. I think if you think about what I say, you will understand what I mean. That is the application of the science that has given such tremendous power that the vilification of the other can end in total annihilation, total destruction, and also in destruction to ourselves in manners which were um, impossible to be realized in days of old. Let me come back to this issue of the cosmic aspect of evil. Before the rise of the scientific revolution in the 17th century, all civilizations, Islamic, Christian, Hindu, Buddhist, all over the world, always considered good and evil to be not only subjective human attitudes, but to have a cosmic correspondence. You have the supreme form of that in the ancient religions of Iran in which the whole of existence was considered to be a play between light and darkness, between good and evil, between Ahura Mazda and Ahriman. And uh, in early Christian thought of St. Augustine, who for 11 years was a Manichaean before he became a Christian, and many early Christian theologians, there's the same emphasis that the very travail of the cosmos, the very workings of the cosmos implies a battle between good and evil. It was thought that the good that we perform had an effect upon the world of nature. And the evil that we perform also had an effect upon the natural ambience around us. How many examples of this have you seen in classical European literature? In the Islamic world, this is very, very much emphasized by the fact that uh, according to Islam, the structure of the universe is related to the, the creation of the state of man the man and woman, the human being, Adam, the uh, veer or anthropos, the that human being who is both gender-wise male and female. 
and if I use the word man here, as, uh, I'm using it as it has been used for since Chaucer until 1964. And if I make a little slip, you'll forgive me. <laughs> I do not mean to, to be sexist in my language. It's hard to learn the English language more than once. It's hard enough to learn it once. In the Islamic perspective, the creation of the world is first of all good in itself. The world was created in goodness, as also the Old Testament and the Christian scriptures, the New Testament attest to. Ma khalaqna hadha batala, the Quran says, verily we have not created this world in vain or in evil. It's the goodness in creation, and this goodness is not simply a subjective moral judgment on our part. Theologically and metaphysically speaking, it's in the nature of things. But this goodness is always combined with evil. Now, foregoing the theological reality of evil and its cosmological significance is extremely costly, I believe, for the human state. It is not accidental that the denial of the reality of evil in the world of nature by modern man has resulted in the almost total destruction of the natural environment in which that man lives, that human being lives, men and women live. It's not at all accidental because we do not believe that our actions in the world of nature have any moral consequence except for ourselves as human beings. Nature itself is not seen as being involved in the moral aspect of our decision, whether good or evil. There are, of course, now forces, including within Christian theology, of developing a new ethics for the world of nature itself, but the mainstream still looks upon it in this way. And uh, the result of denying a cosmic and beyond human reality to evil has also meant the denial of what appears on the human plane as the devil. That is, the devil in Islamic theology and in Christian theology, in a sense, is a kind of personification of this cosmic tendency of the fall, of the fall away from the divine principle. Now, now in the Islamic world, the devil hasn't lost his reality yet, thank God. Uh, because once you don't believe in the devil, it's very hard to believe in God. The famous French poet Baudelaire once said, to believe in God, you have to believe in the devil. And there's a profound saying to this. You cannot say, I'm good, God is good, there's no evil, I'm, I'm just, uh, the devil is just hallucination, there's only God. That a great saint can say, as I said already. But for the rest of us, what appears in Scripture, whether it's Jewish, Christian, Islamic, Hindu, Buddhist, Taoist, anywhere in different languages, as being the evil one, the devil, has been always a very powerful way to bring home the reality of evil on the human plane. Now, each religion has seen this personification of evil and the manifestation of evil in human society and human life, of course, in a different way. What I stated at the beginning as evil being the fall from the state of perfection, that is really universal. All religions believe that we have fallen in some way, that there is a perfect state to which we have belonged. But how this is described in different religions is somewhat different. Let me concentrate for a moment on the Islamic tradition. Uh, the verses of the Quran pertaining to this say that verily we created the human being. Uh, and the word in Arabic, insan, doesn't have the problem, gender problem, because it's like mensch in German, means both men and women. In the best of stature, fi ahsan taqwim, then we cast insan, the human being, to be the lowest of the low. Now this verse, of course, says it's all God's fault that we're here. That's another question, what, what are we doing here? Uh, I wish we had time to go into that issue. Uh, that why is it that God created the world? Because once creating the world, he has separated us, ourselves from him. That's the question of God wanting to know himself. He wants to be loved through free will and all the profound theological questions into which I cannot go. But what this verse states 
is that there is such a thing as the perfection, the norm of the human state. And uh, this norm determines for human beings what is good and what is evil. What is it that determines what is good and what is evil? This is a very contentious and important issue in modern secularized society. Who defines what is good? Who defines what is evil? And many people have relativized that to the extent of saying, well, what is good for one person might be evil for another person, for one society evil for another society. But there is something that, if from a point of view of logic, seems contradictory, but nevertheless is meaningful, that is relatively absolute within each religious universe. That is, within the Islamic universe, there are certain norms which are absolute within that universe and which determine what is good and evil. In the deepest sense, all of these norms meet, and they really meet in the two great commandments of Christ, to love God and to love the neighbor, in a different way, in different language, in different worlds, uh, that it, once you transgress against that, transgress against God and the neighbor, you've committed evil. But how they manifest themselves is not the same. According to Islam, God has given each humanity a sharia, a divine law. The divine law, which is very similar to the traditional Jewish understanding of divine law, the halakha, is a, a guide for human life. It determines what is good and what is evil within society. And throughout its history, until our own times, and I shall turn to this later, uh, what has happening in our own times, uh, the Islamic world always respected the laws of the religious communities that lived within it. That is, Jews living in Istanbul or Cairo or Isfahan could follow their own law in religious matters. And uh, even punishment for people who transgressed against it was based in the hands of rabbis or Christian ministers or priests or whoever they were. Of course, in the East, it was at that time mostly priests. There was no Protestantism. Protestantism came later into the Arab world in the 19th century. Uh, but uh, if you asked a theologian a thousand years ago, what is good and what is evil, a Muslim theologian, on the level of principles, he would say, let's say, denying God is evil, this kind of thing. But when it came to particulars of human life, is it evil for a man of God to marry or not? Question like that which in fact separated Protestantism from Catholicism in the 16th century and caused those wars which lasted 100 years and killed a million people. Uh, they would say, well, this, for the Christian world, their priests and their monks and nuns, it is evil for them to marry. But for a Muslim, it's not evil to marry. Let's say, I'm just giving this as an example. Or is it uh, evil for Muslims to drink? They would say, yes, but it's not evil for Christians to drink. That's why Christians had wineries 300 years ago, when by Islamic law was very strong throughout the Islamic world, and even had herds of pigs. I mean, Armenians had herds of pigs in the 16th century when they were brought from Armenia to Isfahan to settle down along the Zion the Rude River in, in my own country in Iran. So there was this awareness that there's a central aspect to good and evil, which is universal. But each divine norm, that is each law that God has given for various human collectivities, and determines what for specific conditions of human life and actions of human life con constitute good and evil. Now, this always had the danger of absolutizing that norm and calling everyone outside of a particular community or religion or nation or ethnic groups understanding of what good and evil was as being evil. As I said, this danger existed in days of old, and of course, that's not the fault of religion, because communist China and communist Soviet Union, when it was around, they were doing the same thing with communism. This is part of human nature, a kind of tribal attitude that, is, that we have, and which pre, uh, gives itself easily to this kind of exposition. And so this danger existed 
in the old days, but this danger, as I've already said, has never been great as great as it is in our own day. The reason for that is that the very encroachment of the West with all its tremendous power during the colonial period upon the rest of the world, especially the Islamic world, and then the so-called political independence of the Islamic world, which was combined with greater cultural and economic colonialism, really, in these countries, led to a reaction in the Islamic world against the West domination. And this led a number of extremists who were totally exasperated by the fact that they could not carry out ordinary political action through elections, through governments, and so forth and so on, into extremist acts. And with these horrible extremist acts, the worst of, of which is just a couple of blocks from here, the great tragedy that occurred September 2001, there came into being the idea which had been very alien to Islamic civilization during most of its history, not all of its history, most of its history, that in fact, we are the good and the, the Westerners, uh, crusaders, or whatever you'd like to call them, they are evil. This is the great danger that came, has come about from this side. From the Western side, this is very interesting, nobody talks about the other side. We have today in America a number of uh, missionary evangelical preachers whose hatred against Islam is exactly like what was written in the 10th and 11th centuries in Latin, in Strasbourg, and other places about the life of the prophet. The same insinuations, attacks, in a society like America, where it's not politically co correct to even say something in class about something that might insult somebody's race or religion. The only thing that is free to attack is Islam. If you do that against even Zoroastrianism or the Navajo religion, somebody will come and grab your neck. But for Islam, it's perfectly all right. And this absolutization, which is especially dangerous because for decades and decades, since the Second World War, leading Christian theologians, Catholic, Protestant, the Vatican, the World Council of Churches, the mainstream of both branches of Western Christianity, had sought to overcome this very major problem, which was not only a problem for Christianity's relationship with Islam, but also with Judaism, namely no salvation outside the church. Extra ecclesiam nulla salus. This Latin sentence repeated for century on end, that in fact nobody can come to God except through Christ, therefore people who are not Christians are evil. And this was a very profound and difficult theological issue to deal with. We know how much it was debated before Vatican II. We know how much it was debated in the World Council of Churches. The record is there. I find a number of important theologians came forward on both sides to say that we have to leave this in God's hand. At least the least we can say, even if you don't want to confirm that God has spoken more than once, that the covenant with the people of Israel was not broken by the coming of Christ, or that God may have spoken to Hindus in Sanskrit, if even we don't want to say that, let's leave it in God's hand. This is the, at least the easiest position to take, and someone a step further, try to really understand how God did speak to other people and say that it is not only the Christians who are saved, but others can be saved. After these several decades of struggle, in which a lot of positive uh, things were achieved, what has happened in the last two, three year, years is an undoing very rapidly of all that had gone on before among certain groups, especially in America, not so much in Europe, are people who consider to be themselves to be disciples of Christ, who have forgotten the Sermon of the Mount of turning the other cheek. Perhaps they only have one cheek, I don't know. Uh, but uh, uh, but uh, whatever it is, uh, turning the other cheek, and who are bringing us back to this very dangerous situation of the absolutization of my norm, my laws. And combined with that is a horrendous, really horrendously proud attitude without any humility that I know exactly who is going to be saved. That is what I call eschatological exclusivism. I and my family and the friends next door are going to be saved and the rest of the world is literally going to go to hell. And uh, therefore, we don't care 
as long as we do our own thing. And this very strange theology, which has developed recently, this uh, theology of exclusive eschatology, is an extremely dangerous thing, and it's a form of absolutization of one's own view of good and evil. And th from this point of view, it's really unique, because the Quran does not allow Muslims to say such a thing. And the fact that certain people in, uh, the, let's say, some extremist preacher among the Taliban or among the Wahhabis or something like that might say something like that is negated immediately by the loud voices of the mainstream because the Quran in black and white says that uh, Jews and Christians and the Sabians and others, in fact, he leaves it open, who follow God's teachings and who live a good life, their recompense is with God. That is, it's, uh, it's not that only you are saved. Uh, so it's not, there's not even an equality of the two sides, although there are some people in the Islamic world who really echo what we hear by these extremist preachers in this country. In fact, you have developed a situation now in which between Islam and the West, you have two groups who absolutize themselves, their understanding of what they are and what is good, and demonize the other in an absolute way. And they confront each other, a confrontation which can bring down everything, which can destroy everything, which itself is the worst kind of evil. That itself is evil in the worst sense possible. And to fight against it is the duty of us all, I believe. Now, to confront the evil in the world, not only this absolutization that has taken place recently, but evil that lurks everywhere in our life, at every stage, at every state. We have to carry out, and I use this term on purpose, a spiritual warfare, a jihad. The word jihad has now become very popular in English, and has taken the place of Dao. You're right on Wall Street here. Someone wrote a book a few years ago, The Dao of Wall Street and Got Rich. Any book you wanted to write in the 60s and 70s and 80s to sell a lot, you use the word Dao, the Dao of this, the Dao of that. Now jihad has taken its place. And publishers are killing themselves to, for you to include the word jihad in the title. And as I told my dear friend, like the Moore here, uh, we're talking about favorite titles, the title that would really sell well would be the Dao of the Jihad of Rumi, or, <laughs> or something like that. That would do it. Uh, and this poor misunderstood term has been kicked around a lot, to a large extent. Uh, at one point, only 10 years ago, those people who carried in jihad in Afghanistan were called the Mujahideen, were great champions in the State Department in Washington, and were supported with Stinger missiles and arms and everything else. Now, the only way using the word jihad is the bad guy. This is the kind of uh, politicization of significant terms, and th therefore I'm using it in this lecture on purpose. The word jihad means exertion. It does not mean holy war. It means exertion. But there is a spiritual warfare which is part of human life. You have several great Christian classics of spirituality called spiritual warfare in both Orthodox Christianity and Western Christianity. And this is something which also you'll find in religions that in our mind we associate only with peace because of Mahatma Gandhi, like India, the great Bhagavad Gita, one of the greatest spiritual texts of the world, takes place on the battlefield. It is not that possible to avoid warfare. The question is that for a spiritual person, the warfare should be a spiritual warfare, not a warfare without principles. Again, modern technology has made war so detestable that the positive symbolism of warfare, that even Christ saying taking up the sword in Matthews, these are always put aside. But there is a very important spiritual principle that is involved that I want to bring out on purpose. To be alive is to have to carry out constantly a spiritual warfare to sustain the good, to oppose the evil, and to preserve equilibrium in human life. Islamic theology and Islamic law believe that to reach God, we have to create a, an equilibrium in human life. First of all, within ourselves. We live as a house divided unto itself. 
whether we're Christian, Jews, Muslims, atheists, agnostics, anything else. We have different tendencies within ourselves. Some part of us pull one way, some part of us pull in another way. And uh, there is a constant battle that goes on, even for people who are atheists but trying to lose five pounds. Uh, I mean, there is a constant battle going on with a certain passion within the soul and the other passion of trying to look good or trying to live along a few more years on earth. Uh, there's always a constant struggle that is going on. Now, uh, for the spiritual person, that struggle should not be between two tendencies of the passionate soul to get into beautiful blue jeans or to have a big steak. It should be actually between good and evil, between principles which govern our life, which govern our soul in its ultimate destiny. And uh, therefore, there is constant spiritual warfare that we must carry it out for the good against evil. And the deepest sense of that is to be able to go beyond oneself to be able to eradicate the evil within ourselves. And I shall come back to that in a moment. But let me say that from in Islamic teachings and also in teachings of other religions, good and evil are not equal in the ultimate sense. They are in a sense equal in the, on the plane of everyday life. Sometimes the forces of evil are stronger than the forces of the good, but ultimately, they are not equal because the good represents what is real, the evil represents what is unreal. And that is why in all authentic theologies and metaphysics, and we have some very profound expressions of that in classical Christian doctrine and a great deal of it in Islam, it is said that every partial disequilibrium, every partial evil finally leads to the good, to the triumph of the good. Uh, another very famous Latin sentence, the truth shall always triumph, winked omnia veritas, which was re-uttered in churches like this for uh, 2,000 years, uh, or almost until the Latin was discontinued, uh, means the same thing, that ultimately the victory is with the good. And therefore, the spiritual hero, the person who is aware of the real meaning of human life, never despairs in the battle between good and evil, always certain that the good shall always triumph. And finally, the goal is to go beyond this battlefield through the good that we have done on this battlefield, beyond this duality of good and evil, towards the one who is pure goodness. And therefore, such a person is able to transcend this dichotomy, but never to go to transcend morality on the level of action. That's why I, I, I mentioned this, because there's a famous book, Beyond Good and Evil, by Friedrich Nietzsche, which has influenced the, several generations of Western people. I'm not saying that at all, because Nietzsche wants to have a superman who is beyond good and evil, beyond morality. Spirituality is never beyond morality and the level of morality. It transcends duality, but on the level of duality, it's always on the side of the good, on the side of the moral. Now, when we come to human life, we must realize that we cannot eradicate evil in the whole world. Otherwise, the world would not be the world. That is, all the good that we seek to do must be with humility towards God and the awareness that we are not God, but the best we can do is the, what God has made possible for us to do. But to do good means that, first of all, we must begin within ourselves. That is, to eradicate evil in the world, we must, first of all, eradicate evil within ourselves. A person who is not good cannot do good except accidentally in the same way that a person who is evil can do good accidentally. So the first step is to eradicate evil within oneself, which means always the selfish tendencies of the ego center, the wall which we have drawn around ourselves inwardly and absolutized it. Even believe in God, we are dualists, like 
ancient Manichaeans. There's God out there and me here. And the two are two independent realities. And we don't realize that the me here is actually nothing but a blob in comparison with the divine reality, which is absolute reality. But what we have to do is to break down this wall of the ego. All evil, from a spiritual point of view, comes from this self-centeredness. Since I'm in a church, let me just remind ourselves that St. Thomas Aquinas said that the origin of all sin, of all evil, is pride. And pride is precisely to absolutize our egos, to take us ourselves to be more than we are, to lose the sense of humility. And this is, can be very dangerous when it goes beyond the individual and the whole society considers itself to be wonderful and good and can do no wrong, cannot self-criticize itself. No, if anybody raises its, its voice that we are not doing the right thing, this, oh, you're against the society, you're not patriotic. This combination of patriotism and pseudo-theology is one of the lethal and devastating forces in our world today. And so we must always remember that goodness will only achieve success when it's done through humility, through the realization of who we are and the importance of eradicating evil within ourselves. <coughs> Today, we need to come back to, first of all, accepting objective norms for good and evil. Objective norms which are written deep within the soul of human beings, within the very substance of human nature, as well as confirmed by the messages sent by heaven to various religions. Islam believes that when God created Adam, he breathed his spirit unto him. And Christianity believes that God created man in his image, which is also, of course, a saying of the prophet of Islam. What does this mean? Judaism says the same thing in the Old Testament. It means that the idea of good and evil is within the substance, within the soul of human beings. And that is why there are those among us who do not accept the message from heaven, who consider themselves to be agnostics or atheists, but they feel they have an innate understanding of what is good and what is evil. But the fact that they're atheists doesn't mean that they're going to murder the neighbor tomorrow morning. They don't do that. It's because of, first of all, centuries of teaching of various religions of the good, and also within what is deep down within the human soul. Now, we are not all able to reach deep down within our human souls. We must realize that this has to be reconfirmed. The danger of changing norms constantly to conform to the fashions of the day, to the whims of a particular society at a particular moment of time, is one of the most dangerous ways of, in fact, letting evil reign loose. The best thing that the devil wants from us is that we should forget him. The victory of the devil is in forgetting him. Because once he's everywhere, he would like to be not seen. And if I can speak in this theological language and transfer it to the inner psychological, spiritual language, it's to say that if there is such a thing as evil and good, and I perform this act of evil, and everybody begins to do it, and instead of trying to correct ourselves, we we'll say, oh, no, no, that wasn't really e evil after all. I'm changing the goalpost every few years. That is one of the greatest dangers for human society. In the old days, all kinds of evils that we see today, murder, theft, rape, attack, everything you can name under the sun existed. Existed. It's in Dante's Inferno already. Uh, and in Islam, make texts everywhere. But the norm was never sacrificed. The norm was never sacrificed for what a particular society at a particular time or those who are uh, opinion makers in that society happen to think and happen to make. And so today we face this great danger uh, of, in a sense, destroying our possibility of confronting evil by denying that the evil things we do are evil at all. And this can go on and on and get very nasty and very dangerous. Uh, because if it's step by step, what human experience over hundreds of thousands of years and the revelation sent us by God for those who believe have considered to be evil, 
and now people or majority of people or number of powerful people are doing it and nobody cares, that means gradually the idea of evil itself disappears. And therefore there's no way of confronting evil in our life. What today would be a personal habit, well, 50 years down the road, it might be that if you kill the poor, it's perfectly all right. Why not? The question which Dostoevsky so beautifully confronted us with in his novel, Crime and Punishment. <coughs> the theological, the religious understanding of good and evil, and that which is innately within the conscience of human beings, I think must be kept alive, especially for men and women of religion who claim to speak for God's messages on earth and to be able to resist this redefining of good and evil simply to placate the fashions of a society which changes very rapidly. Again, a term I don't like to use, create terms, but I've been using for some time is that we have in America the great danger of tendency of absolutizing the transient. That whatever transient period we live in, we absolutize it as if this were absolute. We have no interest in history, no interest in theology. And I think everybody is doing something like that, putting a horn on his head. That's how everybody in the world should do it. And we judge everybody in the world according not to what our history has shown, but according to what we're doing right now at this moment. And much of our uh, vilifying of the rest of the earth and vilifying certain elements of our own society is based on this. Complementary to this is, as I said, the danger of, of absolutizing our own moral norms for the rest of the world. We must accept that there are different civilizations, different religions, different norms, different ways of living. Just within our own Abrahamic family, every devout Christian who comes into this church will take off, if he's a male, his hat. Every devout Muslim and Jew who go to a synagogue or a mosque put on a hat. Two contradictory acts with the same meaning of humility before God. So the inner meaning is the same, but the outward act is totally opposed one to the other. And to say, oh no, these Jews and Muslims are terrible people because they don't take off their hat in the house of God, or to say these Christians are terrible because they do take off their hat standing before God, is to misunderstand the multiplicity of God's creation. God did not want to have a single race, a single language, a single society. The Quran says in a very famous sentence, if you had wanted, we would have created you of a single people. But we will create you a different people with different religions so that you would vie with each other in goodness. And so there is a wisdom that there is this multiplicity in the world. And never before as now have we been faced with the importance of accepting this multiplicity, of not forcing ourselves upon the world. No nation, no matter how powerful, how military powerful, except for annihilating the whole earth, can rule over the earth by imposing a single norm upon it. What that will do is simply weaken that nation itself and gradually crumble from within. What I believe we have to do is to face this new challenge, which is a kind of emphasis upon an evil which was always there and which has now become very, very significant. And that is the evil of exclusivism. Is the nature of human beings to be exclusivist. Like we love our own family. We love our own neighborhood. We love our own religion. That's the way it should be. God did not create us to live, let's say, in uh, Kansas or Padua, Italy, and to know Taoist text and enjoy Chinese painting. But we're not made for that. Even in a cosmopolitan areas like New York, which was a melting pot from the time the Dutch came here until now, this is not necessarily the human psyche. And so exclusion in itself is not a bad thing, but it has become an evil because it has become politicized, has become a way of certain forces exerting their will upon others and of causing them a very, very dangerous reactions based upon the same idea of pure exclusivism. 
I, as a humble Muslim scholar, have for years within the Islamic world spoken that the most important thing that Muslim thinkers can do today is to preserve the old traditional inclusivism of Islam. Not that the record of Islamic history was perfect, no, no history has been perfect, but the acceptance of other people, of Jews, Christians, Zoroastrians, Buddhists, and Hindus when Islam went to India, at times when they could have eradicated these minorities completely. Completely. Uh, any caliph could have put every single Jew and Christian to death, nothing would have happened, like what happened in Spain and Iberia in the Reconquest, when the Jews and Muslims were either expelled or killed. It could have happened, but it didn't happen. And to preserve this inclusivism, which today requires of us the heroic act of accepting an inclusivism which includes exclusivism. That is the most difficult thing, and that is the great challenge of the evil that our world is facing today. And as far as the individual is concerned, the goal of human life is to not only combat evil with the good, but upon the basis of that, not by evading it, upon the basis of that, to finally transcend the plane of relativity and to reach the one, the God, the ultimate reality, who is absolute goodness, the light without shadow. Only then can the human being deny the reality of evil because one has reached a level of being which stands beyond <coughs> that tendency of falling away from the center. The, that falling away which on the human plane manifests itself as evil. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Stay here. Oh, please.